welcome to our Songs of Praise service this afternoon. All of those who are here this afternoon in person and any who might be joining us uh, later on on YouTube. Now, this is our annual harvest service. And uh, thank you so much for those who prepared the display. It was Carolyn's uh, doing, I think. I'll stand back and perhaps you can have a look at it later on. It was a lovely display. I'm sure many of you remember the displays we used to have in the olden days. We had harvest loaves and sheaves of corn and so on. It's uh, been a bit uh, toned down a bit these days, but uh, still good to have a visual reminder of all that God has given for us. I'm sorry there's a bit of an echo here. Um, we'll carry on and hopefully it'll get sorted out. Um, yes, it's good to uh, have a harvest, isn't it, once a year, and to remember God's provision for us uh, in every way. Now, it's been a long, hot summer, hasn't it? Now the evenings are drawing in, and it's certainly noticeable cooler, if you've noticed that. Not to mention the odd hailstorm. Did you remember a hailstorm? It just suddenly started tipping down. It hailed and it rattling on the windows and so on. Goodness me. Well, autumn is well on its way now. And looking at the fields around here, the harvest seemed to be early this year. Now, I'm not uh, an expert in these matters. Maybe it was all that hot weather we had in July and August, but it seemed to be very early. But there we go. Now, who here has seen a rainbow recently? Yes, I thought most of us would have done. In the book of Genesis, it reminds us that this is a sign of the promise that God made with humankind after the flood at the time of Noah, that this would never happen again. We were spent seven years down in Devon, and when we were in Devon one year at the church we were part of, one of the church members made a rainbow of different colored fruit, seven different colored fruit in a big rainbow for the harvest. It was magnificent to see. It was also very tasty afterwards. <laughs> God also promised in Genesis that as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Now God is faithful to all his promises and we come to worship and give thanks this afternoon to a faithful God. We're going to sing some of the familiar harvest hymns and also one or two of the newer ones which I hope we'll enjoy. And we're going to hear from different people during the service. But first of all, let's just pray together. God, our loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can come together this afternoon to worship you and to give thanks for all your ongoing provision for our material as well as our spiritual needs. You truly are a faithful God. As we worship together, may we know your presence with each one of us. May we hear what you would say to us. And may we know the love and care you have for each one of us in so many different ways. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now the hymns will come up on the screen if uh, you haven't been with us before. Uh, and our first hymn reminds us of the beauty of the world around us. And of the joy of knowing the love of God and others day by day. Uh, so after that, Irene is going to come and tell us something of her life and experience with God. But before that, if you're able to stand, let's stand and sing For the Beauty of the Earth.
share with us something of her experience. You should say five minutes, didn't you, Philip? <laughs> <laughs> into four years, into five minutes. No, I'm just going to talk about where I am with God today, really, what's happening in my life. Since we last met, I've had two major celebrations. I get them every year. On uh, September the 6th, it's 74 years since the day that I heard the Lord say to me, as he said to Isaiah, who will go, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I went straight up to my room, knelt down by my bed, and said, Lord, here I am, take me. I had no idea what I was letting myself in for, but I think God must have known what he was letting himself in for, didn't you? <laughs> and I have never regretted that, and I've never lost that sense that God knows me, knows who I am, knows what I am, and loves me, and in spite of all the knowledge he's got of me, he decided that he wanted me to serve him, and that still fills me with amazement, because I'd said to him, Lord, here am I, take me, and immediately I had a very strange experience. How many people here saw The Wizard of Oz when it first came out? <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, don't you? There's a moment there when um, the cyclone comes and the girl, Judy Garland, I forget what her name in the film is, Judy Garland was knocked unconscious and when she woke up, the world wasn't black and white anymore. <coughs> It was Technicolor. And we hadn't seen much Technicolor, had we? And I remember in the cinema, there was a, oh! Well, the day I knelt down by my bed and said yes to God, that's what happened to me. And it's been Technicolor ever since. Of course, it hasn't been easy all the time, but that's the way it's been. So that's the first celebration. There was a celebration at the end of July, which is even further back. And that goes back 94 years, because the 26th of July was my 94th birthday. What happens when you're in your 90s? My experience is that you suddenly realize that you're a lot nearer dying than you have been before. <laughs> <laughs> and I think everybody experiences that, but we don't all experience it in the same way. I've talked to so many people in my years as a follower of Jesus, and I know that a lot of people are dead scared of dying, and they cope with it by pretending it's not going to happen. So we don't talk about dying. We don't talk about dying. And if we don't talk about it, it won't happen. But I find since I became a believer in Jesus, that I can face dying. Because I know that the Bible says in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he sent his son so that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I just want to close by saying to you, I'm not afraid of dying. Do you know, you won't believe this, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> because as Paul says in the Bible, it's going to be far better. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Irene that we all need to take on board, don't we? Death will happen to all of us one day. As I say, I'm looking forward to it in one sense. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Irene. Thank you.
Now, I didn't think we could have a harvest service without singing our next hymn, which is number, well, it's not number, it is number 732, but you don't have a hymn book, do you? So that doesn't help matters at all. <laughs> you can probably guess what it is, though. We plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land. This uh, reminds us about all the good gifts that God gives us, and they're ultimately from God. And after we've sung this very familiar hymn, hope you enjoy singing it, Annette is going to come and introduce the hymn that she has chosen and tell us why. But before that, let's stand if you're able to, and we'll sing, we plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land. encouraging I would say when Philip asked me to choose a song for this songs of praise and could I let him know quickly in Christ, <laughs> in Christ alone was the first hymn that came to my mind this was written sometime around very recently 2001 to 2003 by Stuart Townend and Keith Getty this is the first hymn that these two had written together. Keith Getty wrote that he wanted a song that tells the story of Christ coming to earth, and as he puts it, the whole gospel story in one song. A few weeks later, Keith sent Stuart some melodies and ideas written on the back of an electricity bill. <laughs> Stuart loved the melody and started writing down some lyrical ideas on what they wanted to say, covering the life, the death and the resurrection of Christ and the implication on their lives. This I found amazing. 
the melodies or the music coming first and the words then written for the music, finding out that what they wanted to convey in this song was the life, the death and the resurrection of Christ and the implication for their lives put into words why this hymn means so much to me. Over the years, I've had various occasions when this hymn has spoken to me, and one example was at a Thanksgiving service for someone called Sarah, a very close friend of our daughter's who died of cancer in her 30s. To see the young people who were perhaps experience, experiencing a close friend's death for the first time, singing in Christ alone and knowing that they'll be reunited one day was a very moving experience. There's a beautiful theme running through this hymn. At the end of the first verse, it says, here in the love of Christ I stand. In the second verse, here in the death of Christ I stand. And in the third, bought with the precious blood of Christ. And finally, in the fourth verse, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Always when I sing in Christ alone, the lines in the third verse come home to me. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world in darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. The glorious hope of resurrection. And this is just a little aside at the end. Following on. Some of the words from the Princess of Wales struck me that she spoke this past week. She said, out of darkness can come light, so let that light shine bright. Jesus said in John 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I hope and pray that the princess has that assurance. And back to those words, there in the ground he lay, light of the world in darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. Thank you very much, uh, Annette. It's a great hymn. I think it's one of those that's going to last a time. The, the tests of time, I really do, is one of the more modern hymns. It's a great hymn. If you're able to stand and sing it, we'll see the words coming up on the screen. If you're not too sure about it, just follow the words. You will have heard it probably on Songs of Praise if you listen to that uh, on the BBC Songs of Praise. It's a great hymn, so let's stand and sing in Christ alone. Oh, 
Well done. Great hymn. I'm going to ask Richard if he'd like to come now and lead us in our prayers. Thank you, Richard. It's very, very true what uh, Philip said about I used to live in a manse in the countryside and my office overlooked the fields behind me. And the uh, farmers had always uh, packed away in July. And then they went on ho holiday at the end of July, before the school holidays, so they wouldn't have all the children with them. They didn't have any children of their own. They just didn't want to go away. But it's good to come and talk with God. Let's pray. The first set of prayers, I'm going to put in some pauses. Just to think about Maybe to thank God. Maybe you know farmers or people in the agricultural trade. And you can think and pray for them. Creator God, for daily bread and all who work to bring the harvest home, we bring our thanks today. And Lord, forgive our ingratitude. We, so many of us who have so much, yet waste what you have given to us. And Lord, we pray for those whose harvest is poor, whose crops have withered or been waterlogged, for children in many areas of your globe who are starving. Help those who bring relief and bestow on us as well an unaccustomed generosity that all might share from your garden, all might sing your praise. Creator God, we want to thank you today, the one who is the pro provider of all things that you bring to us. still thinking about farmers the next prayer is to do with those but also brings in those who farm the seas the fishermen for the work of farmers and food producers fishermen and all who bring food to our tables for those who work in all weathers to pick the crops tend animals manage our agricultural countryside for those farmers struggling to make a living and for those whose work on the land and at sea is hard, dangerous, or unrewarding. For those who've suffered mental ill health as a result of the pressures of farming or life at sea. For those for whom food is an expensive luxury. Those living on a small amount of money a day reliant on food aid to sustain them and their families. For those unsure where their next meal will come from. For all those for whom hunger for them is a reality of life. For our environment and wisdom to be able to balance the need for food with the impact of our food demands that we may be good stewards of God's creation. For ourselves, help us to be wise in the decisions we make about food and its impact on our world and also on ourselves, that we may be able to help to feed the hungry, that we may always see our food as a gift from you, Lord, brought to us 
by the hard work of so many. And shall we end this communication with God with the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now before we have our Bible reading, which John's going to bring us, and our talk from Carolyn, we're going to sing another of the, I would suggest, the better known modern hymns. If you watch BBC Songs of Praise, I'm sure you'll have heard this one more than once. It's all about the many reasons, more than 10,000 reasons, why we can bless the Lord. It's called Bless the Lord, O My Soul. And you'll see there are 10,000 reasons, if not more, why we can bless God. If you don't know it, just uh, enjoy those who do know it and join along, sing along with us as we sing it together. So if you'd like to stand, we're going to sing Bless the Lord, O My Soul. Lord, I 
reading is from Acts chapter 14, beginning at verse 8, and it's uh, part of uh, Paul's first missionary journey. In Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that, his faith, that he had faith to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, men uh, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, They had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered round him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derbe. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Well, I love Harvest Festival. I remember um, when I was a teenager, I was in a, a church choir in an Anglican church. I wasn't yet a believer, but I loved to sing. And I just loved uh, the Harvest hymns. And I hope you've enjoyed something, singing some of them this afternoon. We don't get to sing them often, do we? Just once a year. But what a joy to have the opportunity again to stop and just say thank you to God for his provision for us, the fruit of the land that we enjoy every day. I was just thinking over all the processes that get food from our land to our plate. It's amazing, isn't it? When we stop and we can give thanks for all those people involved in making that provision a reality for us. As I popped my bread in the toaster this morning, I was thinking about this staple that we just pop in the toaster or make a sandwich with, with hardly a thought. And yet I was thinking of all those who've made it possible, the farmer who plants and tends and reaps the crop, those who harvest it, all the factory workers who mill and grind and wash and mix and shape and prove and bake and package this bread. The lorry drivers who transport first the grain and then the completed bread. The supermarket workers. Not to mention all the financial and administrative people in the background. That's a lot just for a loaf of bread, isn't it? Do you know that the average UK supermarket 
has somewhere between 20,000 and 30,000 different products on the shelf at any one time. So much choice. And an army of workers from all around the world that make that possible. I've got a friend and she works in Nigeria and she comes home for uh, about three months every year. And she says when she gets back to the UK and she goes shopping, on her first few shopping trips, she just stands there paralysed, <laughs> looking at the choice, overwhelmed by the choice. But we are truly blessed, aren't we, compared with many other countries around the world. Many people can only dream of five a day, let alone all the other blessings that we've just been singing about. And the Bible tells us that this is God's provision and blessing for us. It's a demonstration of his love to us. When you stare at your plate and eat your dinner, that is a demonstration of God's love for you. This is the God who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them, as Paul tells the crowds in that passage that was just read for us. And you know, the whole of creation testifies to the genius of God's creation. Take a banana, for example. If you take your hand and look at it, from here to here to here to here, you have three joints. Yeah? In your thumb, you have two joints. Have you ever noticed that on the top of a banana, there are three ridges that go beautifully in the three joints of our fingers? And the two joints go beautifully in the two joints of our thumb. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> Isn't God amazing? And do you know, this banana, it has a non-slip surface. It doesn't just slip through. It stays in my hand, doesn't it? And it's colour-coded. Green, not ready. Black, overripe. Yellow, just right. And look, there's a little tab at the top. It's got a biodegradable wrapper. <laughs> look, it's even curved towards the mouth. What a work of genius this is. God made that. Perfectly designed. The Bible tells us that all of creation reveals the order, detail, precision, beauty and creativity of our God. We just have to look. Like the sunflowers in the vase behind me that turn their faces to the sun. It's amazing, isn't it? How does a plant know how to do that? And all those mysteries that develop under the soil. If you haven't yet seen John Stevens' carrots, then over tea, ask him to show you a photo of them. He won first prize in the town show for the, what was it called? The odd vegetables. <laughs> We're spoiled, aren't we, with a diversity of food to enjoy. Sweet, sour, juicy, hard, soft, tasty. All planned and perfected by our God for our enjoyment and benefit. God has not left himself without testimony, said Paul to the crowd in Acts 14. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. The produce of the land is an expression of God's love and kindness to us. In other words, we can point to all that he's given us, the provision he's given us, the provision he's made, and we can say, God, God did that. God gave us that because he loves us. These Things in creation, all the fruit of the land that we enjoy. They point to a living and an active God 
a God who isn't distant from our world, but who is involved in the world he's made, who continues to work on the earth and cause things to grow. Paul reminds us of the order that God has given to the earth, the seasons, the sending of the rain and sunshine, so that things can develop and thrive. The conditions and the means for things to reproduce and for life itself. We sometimes talk, don't we, about an abundance of crops or a bumper harvest. I have lots of um, blackberries coming over my fence at the back of my garden. I don't have to go anywhere else to gather uh, blackberries. I'm very fortunate in that. But there's been an abundance of blackberries this year. Uh, many of you know that there's been an abundance of apples. I thought the apple harvest was open and then yes, uh, over, and then yesterday I was driving along and there was a mound of apples outside somebody's um, front garden saying, please take, with a big exclamation mark. But the abundance was got what God always intended. He doesn't do things by halves. He gives in abundance. And sadly, it's us humans who have spoiled his world, who are selfish and greedy, so that what he's given doesn't go around. So on this Harvest Sunday, we can thank God that he is so good to us. And we thank him especially for the physical food he provides and the abundance we enjoy. But Paul in the passage points out another provision that God makes too. After the lame man has been healed, the crowd start treating Paul and his companion Barnabas as if they're gods, thinking that it's their power and their provision that has healed the lame man. So they start bringing reeds to him and they start wanting to sacrifice bulls to them. Friends, says Paul, why, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. No, we are bringing you good news telling you to turn from those worthless things to the living God, the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You see, creation points us to the living God. Listen to the good news, urges Paul. That's the important thing. The good news we've been singing around about. In Christ alone, our hope is found. Turn to the true God, the God who gives life and hope, the only one who gives life and hope, says Paul. And as well as providing physical food and provision for our bodies, Paul highlights the spiritual food and provision God gives for our souls. Our souls, that bit that makes you, you. The bit that makes me, me. The bit that connects us with God. Just before the passage that was read to us, Paul and Barnabas were speaking in the Jewish synagogue. They were sharing the good news about Jesus, how he came to this earth, how he died and rose again to take away the barrier of sin between us and God. How he made it possible for us to know God now and for eternity. And verse 1 of uh, Acts 14 tells us that Paul and Barnabas spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. In other words, new life of a different sort sprang up. A new life that came through faith in Jesus. There was a harvest of souls. Later in the passage, we find out that the lame man was listening to all this. Paul um, speaks of that in the passage. He must have been watching all these people putting their trust in Jesus and starting to follow him. And as Paul looks at the lame man before he heals him, the passage tells us that he could see faith stirring in the lame man too, as he heard the good news about all Jesus had done for him. That faith starts to stir in him too. There's an inner response to what he heard which turns out to be life-changing for him. And the inference of the passage is that the man was healed spiritually as well as physically. In Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says, Seek first 
the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. What are all these things that he promises to add to us? Well, the kind of things we celebrate at harvest, God's provision of our earthly needs, of food and clothes and shelter. We're told to prioritise getting our hearts right with God and living for him first as our priority. And when we do, the promise is that all our other needs will be met by our loving God. Do not be anxious about your life, said Jesus, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing, says Jesus? In other words, there's more to life than our earthly needs. There's more to life than this. And the spiritual provision God has for us is heart and life changing. Not, in, not just for this life, but for eternity. God has made it possible for our hearts to be made right with him. To know his forgiveness, his cleansing. A new start, the assurance of life forever with him. That's his provision for our soul. The Bible says that one day God will bring his harvest home. A harvest of souls. One day we'll stand before him and he will take all who love and follow him to be with him forever. The big question is. Will you, will I, be among those who are gathered in? Our final hymn takes us from creation, the first creation, to the new creation. It was what Irene was talking about, looking forward to. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then shall I bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. I wonder how confidently you could say that verse. I love the verse in Psalm 34, verse 8. It simply says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. On a harvest Sunday, when we're thinking about the fruit of the earth, and God says to us, taste and see that I am good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in me. That refuge in this life and in the life to come. I'd love you to make that first your own, to come before the Lord, to taste and see that he is good and to find your refuge in him. If ever any of you want to talk about any of these things, to make, to make that right in your heart, to make sure you have that assurance that both Annette and Irene were talking about, then we, Philip, myself, others here would love to talk to you about that. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Let's pray together. Father God, on this Harvest Sunday, we thank you so much for all the material blessings we have. The comfort we live in. But most of all, we thank you for your provision in Jesus. Thank you that that provision is an eternal provision. Thank you for the cross, for the resurrection, in order that our hearts might be made right with you. 
Father, help us to seek you first. And help us to seek to live for you while we have life and breath on this earth. And we praise and thank you for your love and your many promises to care for us, both in this life and for eternity. May we look to you always. We say, how great are you, our God. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to sing that great hymn, How Great Thou Art. Let's stand and sing. Thank you to everyone who's taken part this afternoon, and thank you uh, for all coming to share in our time together. 
Our next songs of praise will be on the third Sunday next month. That will be on the 20th of October. Thank you also to those who prepared tea. They're just leaving us. But the, the tea's all prepared, I can assure you. Don't worry. <laughs> It'll be there. They're not leaving the building. They're just going to put the kettle on, I hope. Or whatever. Anyway, thank you for those who prepared the tea. And do stay if you're able to join us for that. And as Carolyn said, please come and talk to any of us, any of us who take part in the service. I'm sure Irene, Annette, myself, Carolyn, any of us, we'll be very happy to talk to you about what we believe and uh, what we say on these occasions. Even if you disagree with us, come and talk to us about it. We'd love you to do that. So now a final blessing as we finish our service. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. When you're ready, do go through and enjoy our tea. Thank you.